Hello and welcome to this webinar and panel discussion about mechanical design and selection of rotating equipment couplings. We're expecting a great attendance today with over 240 people registered for this event. Um, you'll see um, within the software that you can submit questions using the ask a question button and we'll try to address these questions at the end as best, best we can. The webinar will be recorded and made available at the iMickey UK YouTube channel later. We'll also ask you to complete an online feedback form that we send via email. My name is Tim Jones. I'm a fellow member of the iMickey Process Industry Division and Natalie Bradshaw from the iMickey events team will be managing the event today. Sorry about that. My internet connection just dropped. Um, yeah, so um, our main presenter today is um, Morat Islam. Um, he's also a fellow member of the IMICI and a volunteer for the Process Division Committee. Morat is a senior mechanical engineer and technical innovator at John Crane UK Limited, working on design, research and development of rotating equipment couplings at their Trafford Park facility in Manchester. He also founded the John Crane Simulation User Group, which currently has over 140 engineers worldwide. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Murat Islam. Thank you very much, Tim, with the introduction. Um, I will try to make this uh, less company specific and more about couplings and design and development. So let me um, start moving on to my slides um and maybe share my video as well hopefully you can you can see me hello so i will sort of start with the company i'm working for john crane and describe it a little bit and then we will talk about what really does this uh, power transmission coupling term mean um what are the different coupling types we have um what would be the basic sort of uh, principles to select these couplings and maybe look into some bearing arrangements understand the feasibility of it um Think about service and safety factors that we need for these things. Um, think about the environment um, and mainly misalignment and what, what does that mean to, to the rotating machinery. Uh, we will a little bit talk about ratings, uh, touch on the ratings as well. So I will be concentrating mainly on flexible membrane design for fatigue life actually. Um, talk about vibration analysis and maybe show you a little bit of special applications uh, in the same time. So John Crane is actually part of a larger Smiths group. Uh, it's a global technology company whose operations sort of serve security and defense, general industry, energy sectors, space and aerospace. So quite a wide uh, market share they've got. Uh, John Crane is the largest, uh, largest revenue uh, contributor to the group as well. So there are some figures here, but I just wanted to highlight um, John Crane is mainly a sealed systems company. Uh, power transmission coupling business is actually quite small considering, considering the seals. So we, we have a lot of collaboration projects, uh, learn from each other uh, and, and develop our products across the board. So to give you some background on couplings, um, the, this product sort of is uh, quite an old, old product. Uh, and uh, like 17, 1800s is, like, um, is the time that the couplings are uh, introduced, really. But uh, hardly any development made, made at that time. Really, the industrial revolution and automobile revolution sort of uh, pushed the, the product development um, and uh, led to flexible membrane couplings as well. Um, Diaphragm coupling sort of originated in, in 1886, and I will talk about the differences between the flexible membrane coupling and flexible diaphragm couplings. So Metastream is the original company who sort of introduced this uh, diaphragm coupling, flexible membrane coupling, and they really made this for oil and gas industry, especially for pumps. But the British Navy also sort of uh, adopted this uh, for the propulsion drives. So if you think about it, your submarine hits by a torpedo, your transmission unit, your propulsion drive should not fail. You should still be able to escape or maneuver or uh, do whatever you need to do. So couplings are quite critical parts, really, in, in, in the design. 
So MetaStream actually was acquired by Flexbox, which was actually a sales company, and MetaStream remained as a couplings company. So they worked together to, to uh, develop the couplings and sales products further. So tangential disk coupling, which I will explain in more detail later, uh, is introduced in 1970s. So you can see the, the design we have today is actually coming from a long, long history. Uh, there are a lot of couplings in operation at the moment. Um, some actually last over 30 years, 50 years, some of them actually. So T-series, like tangential disk couplings, uh, we call them T-series in John Crane, uh, and they, they mainly serve turbo machinery, but also all the general industry and other, other, other um, industries as well. So some other background here, but I'm not going to read through a lot of it. Uh, basically, couplings develop over the years. Um, every year, they try to introduce something new, add something uh, more valuable for the customer. Um, latest developments maybe include electrical insulation, like standardization, standardization of the product range for electrical insulation insulated couplings. Um, there are all also bespoke designs available anyway. So you can you can come ask come to come to any supplier, go to any supplier and uh, specify all your requirements and they will be able to offer you some 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 products. And you can you can see there are so many different product types available and uh, they will all meet different requirements, different markets. Um, today, John Crane sort of operates in the, all, like all over the world, but the couplings business of John Crane is based in the US, India, um, South Africa, um, but the actual development, product development for couplings happen in Manchester. That's, that's where we do all the, all the interesting stuff, let's say. Um, we basically have, um, provide technical support to our suppliers, uh, to our uh, customers. Uh, we, we provide technical support to our internal customers as well, uh, give them advice. Um, so Manchester being the engineering excellence center and training center, we, we have a lot of knowledge to share. Um, we define the product's uh, capabilities. We do failure analysis, uh, product testing, and further analysis. It may be vibration analysis or maybe stiffness analysis, depending on what, what the customer really needs. So in the Manchester facility, we have some dynamic test capabilities, static test capabilities. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but, but we do understand our product well, and we are learning still more about our product as well. So, so research never ends. We always try to push the product's capabilities further. So to, to give you the background about what really is a coupling, it is basically a simple, well, can be a simple or complicated device that connect two shafts from their ends, really. And the purpose really here is to transmit some power. And the power really is due to rotational speed and some torque that we need to transmit. The simplest coupling you see here is the rigid coupling. You literally just put a rigid piece to, on, on, the, on two shafts and connect them together. And uh, you will have a driver machine that will drive the driven machine through this rigid coupling. The, the difference between a flexible coupling to a rigid coupling is uh, flexible couplings can also accommodate misalignment, which will eventually reduce your bearing loads. So the industry has really high operating speeds, really high torque, um, but also misalignment is quite serious. And uh, if you have a rigid coupling in place, uh, the, the bearings will suffer significantly. So we are trying to reduce the bearing loads. It may well be a lateral load, lateral force, may well be a bending moment. And we are trying to reduce all those loads. So there are, like I mentioned, various coupling types in the industry. Um, you can find competitors uh, solutions like the gear couplings, maybe grid couplings. Uh, there are spring grids. There are universal joints, diaphragm couplings. These can be solid disk diaphragm couplings. So all of them have different purpose. You can have some um, dumping coupling as well, um, even fluid couplings. Um, depending on what you really need, you have to really understand your operation, what, what your uh, product is really need to be doing, what sort of um, catastrophic events may occur in the, in the process, and uh, select your coupling accordingly. Um, like I mentioned, uh, all these requirements uh, can be sort of put down to torque and speed requirement as a main criteria. And you can see different coupling types will meet different market requirements. And some of the couplings will have big, bigger capacity. You can design them to suit different uh, 
different uh, operating points as well. Um, when I talk about flexible membrane couplings, uh, you can literally design a flexible membrane coupling to any requirement, pretty much any requirement. It will have some limitations. If you have some maybe dumping requirement, you may not be able to select these couplings, uh, but really you can literally define a flexible membrane coupling for any speed, any torque, any misalignment requirement. But the combination of those three will, will define what sort of a product you really need, how expensive it will be. So these products mainly sort of support critical industrial applications like the boiler feed pumps, maybe large off offshore pumps, offsite pumps, industrial compressors. You may choose like a screw lobe um, compressor or a vacuum compressor or even different drives, any mechanical drives. So you tend to go with some sort of a cheaper option uh, for those industries that are uh, readily available, um, usually standardized. You have a lot of stock for these materials. You can select them and supply them very fast. Um, then you have some API pump requirements. These basically define some additional safety factors, additional features, safety features for your, for your equipment that require additional design considerations and make the product slightly more expensive. Um, process pumps, compressors, again, uh, tend to be used, tend to be selecting these kind of couplings. But when you go into turbo machinery with very high speeds, very high torque requirements, perhaps, um, very high balancing requirements, perhaps, then, then uh, you will need a high performance coupling. Um, they can sort of support uh, like compressors, gas turbines, steam turbines, um, anything and everything, to be honest. But because of the expense you will have to go through, you, you tend to try and select a standard coupling instead. So you can see some, some uh, sort of environments these couplings have been installed. So I will sort of start with the shaft because that's what we are trying to connect. Um, basically, API 610 specifically sort of requires the shaft to be sort of secured so that your coupling, when it fails, it cannot uh, jump out of the, the vicinity. Um, imagine if you have high speed and if you sort of disengage a component and it starts flying off at knots, speed of knots, uh, if you can literally jump around, like fly around 30 meters up in the air, breaking through any structure you have if it fails and uh, escapes the, the clumped location. So in normal operation, we want to make sure some anti-fly features is available. So if something really breaks, the spacer is contained, it can't fly off. And when it is disengaged, your spacer can still be taken out and assembled uh, for, for, for the purpose. But we definitely don't want things to break up and cause catastrophic problems for, for the site they are operating at. So flexible membrane couplings are made in uh, sort of components, some standard parts, some units uh, to make the assembly easy, supply easy, um, and control of components easy as well. So here you can see we have, we would have normally a shaft on this side and another shaft on this side. We call these parts, the green parts, hubs that connect over the shafts. These are the typical arrangements you would find in the, the coupling. And uh, you would first assemble your hubs onto your shafts. Then you would have the gap here, and you fill that gap with your membrane unit assembly. And that membrane unit assembly will contain the space element as well as the membranes within. Um, and you will have two different main options for a flexible membrane coupling. Um, first one is the tangential disc coupling. Um, we will talk about this in more detail. And you will have the M series diaphragm disc coupling. And what we do is we stack multiple number of membranes uh, next to each other. Maybe here you can see maybe 10, 20 membranes actually stacked. Uh, here you may maybe have uh, 10, 15 membranes stacked. And uh, because they are flexible, they accommodate misalignment and they take all the torque you need to you need to transmit. So in the shafts, we also have different interface options. Um, you may have a parallel shaft that you will need maybe a keyway on the shaft and you assemble your hub through a grub screw to secure it on it. Um, you may also have a tapered shaft, again, maybe a loose fit. It's not really a loose fit. It will be an interference fit here anyway. Um, then you will have to secure it with a knot at the end, and uh, you will still have a key to transmit the torque. 
So the torque transmission here is really, really mainly done through the keyway. But you can also have a more specialized arrangement and not have a keyway at all. You may have to use a hydraulic insulation fit to expand the hub and slide it over the taper shaft. And as you take down the pressure, it will clump on the shaft. So this will be the most um, sort of balanced way to um, assemble a hub. Your concentricity will be perfect. Uh, you will have a high interference fit. Your hub will actually be totally secure here. This additional knot here is really added there as a further reliability. You don't expect the hub to disengage or slip, but uh, if it happens for any reason, you don't want it to slip out of the shaft and damage things. Uh, that's why you tend to put a securing knot here to, to make sure additional reliability for the, for the couplings. And the special equipment required for this can be quite expensive to hire, uh, quite expensive to operate and require high training, uh, extensive training to deal with. Uh, the, the installation process can be dangerous if you don't know what you are doing. Um, you will see some harsh sounds when you're assembling these things together. So experienced people will be required to to assemble these things. So you can you can see um, why the prices may, may rise as well. So let's talk about the markets and um, what sort of uh, products would probably meet these markets. You have all sorts of different markets here, like the marine industry, food and beverage industry, power generation, even refrigeration. Waste and water is another important area because you have a lot of pumps involved. Turbo machinery is what we like to work with because of the high speed and bigger challenges in that. Even the cooling tower applications, anything rotating will need a coupling, some, some kind of coupling in that. So flexible element type, you can have a metallic membrane flexible element or you can have an elastomeric element. The elastomers tend to have some dumping characteristics associated with them, but because they wear out, uh, you will have to replace the elastomer quite frequently. Let's say within a year or so, you would probably have to replace the elastomer element. But metallic membranes can operate over 30 years, sometimes 50 years, if you selected it properly and uh, designed it accordingly. You can also have some fail-safe features for your couplings. Uh, you can say the coupling may need to disconnect upon failure, and then that forces you to select the diaphragm coupling that up, uh, when, you, when you reach a failure, the, the, the product shears and stops transmitting torque, but all the parts will still be able to rotate for a certain number of uh, cycles. So you can also have some specialized equipment uh, to, to do a similar job as well. Some considerations I want to go through here um, when you select a coupling. You will obviously have to some have to meet some industrial requirements like API 610 requirement, maybe API 671 requirement for a high performance coupling. Um, they will have an equivalent ISO standard associated with them. You will also have some ATEX, like explosive environment requirements. You want to make sure if something fails, you don't generate hot sparks that can ignite a, a, a fuel. Uh, that fuel may well be a dust of flour. It may well be a hydrogen in the environment. It may well be other other chemicals in there that can ignite uh, in the in the atmosphere. Um, you may need to consider if you need or if you need a hot work permit or not, because that will limit what you can assemble with. Uh, in case uh, you want to expand your hub by heating the hub. Um, you may need to increase the temperatures to about 200 to 210 degrees Celsius. Uh, you will need a hot, hot work permit for it. And if you want to get away from that, you will need a hydraulic insulation. Or maybe you need a keyway insulation that doesn't require you to uh, heat up any part. But then you need to think about, do I have high interference or do I need uh, low interference and define what, what you really need to be selecting for an interface point of view. You obviously need to consider all the tools you have to use and if those tools will be able to fit into the areas you need to assemble your bolts. Is there enough space to fit my couplings transmission unit? Your spacer length may be limited. If you think about it, your bore size on a shaft may be too large and uh, you may have to select a larger size coupling, although the torque capacity of the coupling will be significantly high. So there are various considerations here. Um, like the maintenance is another thing. Um, if you are happy to maintain your coupling, you may go and select an elastomeric coupling and keep 
looking at uh, replacing some elastomers. Or if you use a grid coupling or a gear coupling, you, you are happy to replace the oil every now and again. But you have to maintain them quite frequently. If you select a flexible membrane coupling, you can just fit it and forget about it altogether, literally. Um, excuse my doorbell ringing at the moment. Uh, I'll have to ignore it. Um, you can also consider the speed, misalignment, torque, cost, and especially customer preferences. These are the really main factors to, to define and select a coupling. I especially put here customer preferences because you can have the best coupling in the world, but if your customer chooses to use a certain type of coupling, it will be very difficult to convince them to do otherwise. You have to go with a very, very detailed technical backing uh, and commercial backing to, to convince them to select, select the coupling you want them to select. So there, is a, there are a lot of considerations in that kind as well. Um, we have stiffness and vibration problems sometimes, so you may hit those problems in operation. We do our best to analyze them before we provide a coupling uh, to avoid any issues. But if you do have issues, then we have to bespoke modify some parts. Uh, that will be an important aspect. Uh, the balancing of a coupling, when you obviously spin a part, you will introduce centrifugal force, very high centrifugal force. If you have eccentricity and imbalance, that will cause a lot of force laterally acting on your bearings. And we have to consider all these. And the API standards basically define what tolerances you need for the balancing. So we have to work to higher standards when it comes to high performance coupling compared to a standard uh, T-series coupling, let's say. And reliability is another concern, maybe. Um, if you want a really reliable coupling, you may want to select the diaphragm disc coupling because their mean time, to, mean time between failures tend to be over 50 years on average. So they are really safe, reliable couplings. Um, just talking about the bearing arrangements here, why you would need a certain type of coupling because of the number of bearings you have in your system. Um, if you look at this diagram here, if you have just two bearings in a system, you will have to have a rigid coupling in between. Because if you don't have a rigid coupling, the, the, the shafts will start bending everywhere. You will not be able to contain the displacements. You will have serious misalignment and fail, fail the coupling or fail the bearings as well. If you have three bearings in the system, one side is nicely parallel, kept as it should, but the other end is able to rotate around. So you can have a single flexible element here to accommodate the angular misalignment. Um, but you cannot have a parallel misalignment here like you can have on the double uh, uh, double membrane pack system. But that requires obviously four bearing systems. Then you will have a spacer in between. You have two flexing elements. Then your shafts can be parallel offset. And reaction forces acting on your bearings will still be significantly low compared to these arrangements. So that these are some considerations here. So. We talked about the installation feasibility a little bit, and I just want to give you a picture here. Um, I think this is taken from a wind turbine transmission. Uh, I, I can't quite remember what, what this assembly is for, really. But you have some braking system, um, some some gearbox, so some rotor here as well. To me, it, it is a wind turbine application. Um, you will have to fit a coupling into a space that's already predefined by the customer. So you have to work with what, what, whatever length they need. And uh, depending on the operating conditions, how much fluctuating torque you would have in the system, you may have to select a different type of coupling. So you need to think about existing components, any adapters we already have in place, all the shaft dimensions, and you may have a guard to protect the coupling in there. You may have to limit the outer diameter you can have on a coupling that will limit what sort of coupling you can select. Um, all the spigot socket arrangements for uh, assembling the coupling and maintaining the concentricity of parts, you have to consider all them. Um, you have to consider all the adapter bolt PCDs, but pitch circle diameter, where your bolt is uh, fitted onto a part. If the customer have a very large bolt PCD, you may have to design a special adapter to suit the design because you want to select the smallest coupling possible for the application to be able to be offering a competitive solution for your customer. Um, lifting operation limitations. So imagine this is a wind turbine. You have some other components in there, you can only lift a certain height. All these things have to be considered that may drive, uh, that may limit how much weight you can have uh, for a coupling. Um, all sorts of other, other requirements come into play when, when you are 
working in a constrained environment. You will have bolt tightening tools. Um, imagine I'm trying to tighten these bolts here. I can only have a certain length on my uh, tool. Um, if I make the adapter too short, I won't be able to assemble it. So if I make it too long, I may make the coupling too soft. So there are various things we have to compromise to make a design work for, for, the, for the application. So again, I, like I mentioned, laminate flexible membrane couplings uh, can work in shear in diaphragm arrangement or tension in the tangential disc arrangement. Um, they will sort of cope with high misalignment. Um, they will be tightly bolted onto parts, so there will be no backlash or they will be, there will be no uh, clearances. There is no, no fluctuation in the displacements, let's say, quite, a, quite low power loss. Thin. So imagine if you have a gear coupling and you have some backlash, you keep hitting uh, torsional vibration or you, you keep um, having some vibration issues. All those vibration phenomena will cause power loss in your system, basically. Um, you will have no maintenance uh, for these membranes as long as you select them right for the application and your misalignment levels are within the design parameters. Typical operating life would be about 30 years plus. Um, if you select it right, if, you, if the corrosion is also not an issue, you can easily push over 50 years as well. Um, you can design a coupling for various requirements up to like 9,000 RPM. This is a significantly higher rotation for a coupling, power transmission coupling. Two mega Newton meter, that, that, that's again seriously high, high torque level. But actually, when you combine these two, you cannot select a coupling. You have to make some compromises between either speed or the torque. And uh, depending on what levels of stress these generate, you may have to reduce your misalignment levels as well to select a coupling. So there are some compromises to be made. Looking at the flexible membrane packs to give you what really happens in operation. So you have the motor driving the pump here and you have a flexible coupling in between. Your membrane starts rotating in this way. And uh, the yellow points I made here, I assume like fixed or the driven machine. They are bolted to the driven machine. And the white areas, which is the driver, which will be, the, which will be bolted to the motor for you. And between these two links, you will either have tension or compression depending on the direction of rotation. So if these two points are fixed and I'm trying to drive it based on moving this bolt on this way, on that direction, I'm basically putting this link under tension, putting that link under compression. And depending on all the bending stresses you have, uh, you will have a cyclic moment, a cyclic stress associated with it and um, that will cause some fatigue issues. So we have to design a coupling membrane pack to meet the cyclic stress requirement uh, and fatigue endurance limit for, for the product. While considering all the speed stresses, all the centrifugal forces, all the misalignments and all other, other things that can happen in operation. So what other things we that, that what other things can you think of like that causes misalignment? What, what really causes the misalignment in a system? So I made a list. I'm trying to just literally go through them uh, quickly for you. So you will have some initial residual alignment because of some part tolerances you have on all your shaft arrangement, all the bearing clearances, all the dimensions on every individual bolt, individual uh, membranes, individual spacers, guards and hubs you have in place, all of those parts will have some tolerance. And they will all differ from part to part as you do the manufacturing. So the tighter the tolerances, the more expensive the part will be, but then it will be better aligned, it will have better misalignment capacity. Um, I gave you some typical dimensions here, tolerance-wise. So we are actually working to quite tight tolerances. Um, the machine surfaces generally is 3.2, but critical surfaces can be RA 1.6, quite fine tolerances on, on parts that, that need to mate each other. And you have some imperial parts, you have metric units, um, and sometimes you have to do some conversions. Um, you may have to work with some discrepancies between these two as well, uh, and uh, you end up with different stack up of tolerances as well because of that difference. And you will have some interference fits in the place, and uh, you can never know how far the interference fit will be in the assembly. You define some tolerances for the interference fit, 
but you don't know exactly where it will be. So you may have to define some accommodating uh, membrane shim packs, maybe, to differ, alter your spacer length, actually, in a coupling assembly. So, but these things can also add to the misalignment if you work to a predefined distance between the shaft ends. You can also have thermal expansions. Imagine you have a cold pump that's assembled, but then when you operate it with a hot, hot fluid, it will expand. And it will, because of the different materials, different materials in place, like your foundation is different material, your bolt uh, will be different material, all your parts will be different materials. They will have different bending uh, all over the place. Your pipes um, will bend as well. That will put some misalignment into your system. The other thing that can happen is as it expands, it will start compressing your coupling because this side is expanding, this side is fixed in place, and you start compressing the coupling over time. So we may have to design some axial pre-stretch in the assembly so that when it is in hot operation, you have perfect alignment. So we can de design products for, for suiting that kind of an application. You will also have pipe strain. Uh, as the pressure rises on the pipe, it will start bending. It will put some lateral forces, axial forces, or even bending moments, and it will move the pump. Maybe basically, it will have some bending on the on the pump that will change the alignment on, on a pump as you operate it. Pipe strain is something critical again. Um, you may have some, like I said, clearance, backlash, or float in the system. If you have a keyway, if you think about it, all these parts will have some tolerances. You will do your best to have some interference in there, but uh, they will still have some slip in there. Your key especially will rotate within the within the keyway, uh, so it will take up some, some slack. But uh, usually, once it, it does that and you operate in one direction, uh, it, it really works like a smooth drive again. It doesn't have the backlash after it is um, torqued up and operating in the same direction. But if you think about if you have positive torque and then negative torque, that keyway may rattle back and forth. That may force you to select a hydraulic fit coupling that doesn't have a keyway. So you may need a keyless fit for that kind of an arrangement. Or you may have a splined arrangement, which I didn't mention here, but the splines also will have very high interference and they don't work like a gear. Uh, they will have a very high interference. They will not have any backlash at all. So think about the bearings, gear teeth, any boring keys when you when you think about uh, what can cause the, these additional misalignments. So what else is there? You will have a foundation unit to assemble your drivetrain. And uh, these foundations over time may creep. They may have some embedding because of the weight acting on them over time. Um, you may have some cracking in the system. Uh, all these micro misalignments over time build up uh, and can cause millimeters of misalignment. And it may be sufficient to fail a coupling. Um, so you need to consider how healthy is the condition of my foundation. And if needs be, replace the foundation. We also have some harsh environments, corrosion and wear. As you have corrosion and wear, you may have lose the contacts in the uh, in place. Your flange contact may alter. Your bolt hole clearances may differ. That may eventually cause some uh, backlash again, some float in the system. But also corrosion and wear cause um, maybe other distortions in the part as well because of uh, you have some corroded areas. Some areas aren't corroded, but you have thermal expansion and that, that will change the way the part will deform. It may well be a small deflection again, but it will affect, it will introduce some misalignment. You will have micro movements between parts um, that may be seen as like fretting, usually seen around the bolted joints if you have very high vibration parts tend to slip actually but these are all micro movements these are like not visible to eye only over time when you realize some residual corrosion you, you then say oh actually there was some fretting here you need to investigate if there are any significant vibration issues here um, material incompatibility that causes corrosion obviously you may also have some stray electric currents that, that go through one part to another area go through the part from one position to another position, depending on different uh, cathodic arrangement. You find these usually in railway industries. Some railways tend to have similar phenomenon. Uh, stray currents start corroding, corroding the railways. Same thing can happen in any part, to be honest, and, and cause some, some serious issues. So if you have some electric currents, you may need to electrically insulate your coupling. 
you may have hydrogen embrittlement, you may have galvanic corrosion, all these different things can impact. You may have stress cracking as well, especially if you are selecting a material that has higher than 1000 megapascal yield strength. These are all figures defined in research and uh, defined in industrial standards. So if you look at a flexible element coupling, uh, this is sort of a simulation that is exaggerating the misalignment and the pre-stretch. This is literally pre-stretched membrane. That basically means your bolts are actually at a larger bolt PCD and your membrane is under actually tension all around. But then after you have that, you start rotating your coupling. You are driving this maybe in that direction. You put this link under tension, that link under compression. You can see this, this side gets a lot higher stress and that side loses that stress. But if you keep changing the direction of rotation, this one becomes under tension, that one becomes under compression, and you are then putting cyclic stress on your membrane. So you need to consider the fluctuating torques. You have to consider if the compression link is under buckling or not, uh, if it is deforming too much. Um, and, and if you have very high axial misalignment, then you will have high bending moments here, although this shape doesn't have any axial misalignment. So we will transmit the torque, provide flexibility, accommodate the misalignment. Uh, T-series tangential disk will transmit the torque under tension along the link, and compression link will hardly take any load. Um, then uh, you can say you can change the scalloped shape here to change the characteristics of this membrane, and competitors have done that. They have Some of them have used a straight line. Uh, that may give you more torque capacity, but it adds more mass here. So if you have high speed, you may find this shape works far better. Uh, with misalignment, this one will be more flexible, less bearing loads on your system. So you can see why some coupling membrane shapes work better for some applications and some work better for other applications. You can change the number of links you have in a system. Uh, 6, 8, and 10 link tend to be our standard range, but we can design 4 links and 12 links as well. You wouldn't go any more than this, really, because uh, you tend to realize you may as well choose a different type of coupling instead of a flexible membrane coupling if you start increasing the number of bolts. Um, if you try, need to transmit that much torque, your misalignment have to be really small anyway. You may have to just go for a diaphragm disc coupling. Um, here is a simulation um, for, for that shape. You can see how the pre-stretch uh, happens in the system. Pre-stretch goes in, then you start putting tension due to the driving of the, of the membrane. Obviously, this is just an arbitrary shape. It's not, not for a product. One other thing I have to mention here in the selection of a coupling, we have to consider some safety factors before we even start selecting a coupling. And uh, these are sort of called service factors, and uh, they are sort of defined by um, rated torque for a coupling divided by the duty torque for the system that you're operating. So if my coupling capacity is the rated torque, my pumps uh, or electric motors uh, duty torque will be, will be that value. And you have to have a service factor defined based on this. And depending on how smooth the drive is, how constant the torque is, you then select either a service factor of one for a smooth drive, or if you increase the fluctuating the torque, you may have to increase your safety factor. So I have to select a coupling for this 1.5. Um, coupling has to be at least 1.5 times stronger than the duty requirement. And if you start increasing the fluctuation, substantial torque fluctuation, my coupling has to be two and a half times more than the uh, due to torque requirement. So I'm starting to increase the coupling size compared to the shaft size maybe, because I have significant fluctuating torque. And you can see numbers quickly rise when you have reciprocating engines, which have seriously high uh, reverse torque in application, exceptionally high fluctuating torques in the system. Um, you may have very high viscosity in a mixer. You may have some really high slurry uh, fluid to, to transmit. Um, that will, again, require higher safety factors in the system because your torque will fluctuate significantly. Um, when you look at the high performance couplings, um, you can see the comparison between the previous graph to, to here. Uh, we have to have an additional 1.5 safety factor for high performance coupling because of the industrial standard requirement. 
Again, the numbers rise in a sim similar fashion. But high performance coupling tend to work uh, with um, higher application factors because the industry requires um, critical components to be safer than the industrial components. One other thing to mention here, I suppose, is the modifiers and the variable frequency drives that you may add to your system. So if you initially had a coupling system uh, and it was a smooth drive and you selected your service factor as 1.0, but then you decided to add a gearbox to the system because you, you just wanted it for a different operation, um, you can't use the same coupling potentially because it will increase the minimum service factor requirement to 1.5. Your coupling has to be at least 1.5 uh, safer than the than the duty requirement. For fluid coupling, it is 1.1 as a minimum requirement. So modifiers, if you add it to a new system, you need to think about it. Uh, you need to say, you need to find out if if the coupling will be impacted by this, and do not just add a modifier in place. Same thing with the variable frequency drive or alternating frequency drive, and for them it's even worse actually, 1.75 times. Although it makes the torque and speed gradually increase, it still causes uh, torque fluctuations for our coupling that, that requires some additional safety factor. So, so bear that in mind when you are uh, changing or adding a new component to your drivetrain system. So here I want to sort of go into a bit more detail about the API 671 high performance coupling requirements for ratings. So the plot you see here is called modified Goodman plot. And I've got various regions defined in here. So some things to highlight here is uh, it is basically a fatigue analysis for infinite life or limited life uh, cycle. You tend to use a stress to cycle curve to define a material characteristic. How many number of cycles would it take to fail the coupling at this stress level? And uh, as you increase the number of cycles, the, the stress it will take will be less. So we generate an SN curve, stress to life curve, stress cycle curve, and then and then we use that data and define our endurance limit, endurance stress. So we put it on this axis. And then we put a straight line to this ultimate tensile strength of the material on a, on a horizontal axis. And we call that axis our steady stress. So we have a steady stress, we have a cyclic stress, alternating stress on this axis, and we fit this line here. And this will be the first line we need for in the fatigue analysis. Then we will have a yield strength, and that will be Again, the same yield strength at the other side on the cyclic stress component, and it will cut across the, the region and define this failure region. So here we have the yield failure region. So if you operate at this point, you will definitely have yielded your membrane or your material. But if you operate in this light gray region, you will have a finite life. That will be um, usually typically less than 10 to 7 cycles, like 10 million cycles, less than 10 million cycles the material can survive. So modified Goodman line is defined based on this green line. And uh, for momentary one-off scenario as the worst case scenario, um, you want your coupling to be able to cope with this line. You want to define your momentary capacity for a coupling, considering all your stress components, like the torque, like the misalignment, like the speed, and build up all the steady stress based on that, plot it against this axis, and find out what the cyclic stress that operation requires, and um, fit it onto a point. Let's say I rated my torque this much, rated my speed stress that much, and axial stress that much, I edit them all up together and find out my st steady stress component. And I found this yellow point here. And I found associated angular, like cyclic capacity for, for that point and defined all my characteristics for the coupling. How much cyclic torque can I survive? Can I accept for the coupling? And if you start moving this line to another point further away from here, you will end up having a lower safety factor. 
fatigue safety factor here is 1.0. On this region, you have 1.15. On this region, you have 1.25. And uh, that orange line is exactly 1.25. Anything below that will be higher safety factor. The purple line is 1.15. And uh, you can then start playing with numbers. Um, maybe change your ratings to operate at a different point, but allow for higher cyclic stress. So you can then start configuring your capacity of the coupling based on different requirements and play play with different numbers. Um, you tend to find in applications, yes, we do have a coupling rating, maybe this, but actually we, we need to have uh, we need to have a we need to select a standard coupling which has a standard defined capacity. And for the capacity of the coupling, um, we may have this line, but operating point may well be lower than that. So in operation, you may find your fatigue safety factor will actually is significantly higher. So you should never expect a failure anyway. Like this is an infinite life curve. Literally, we are operating in the infinite life region. You don't expect your membrane or other parts to fail in this region. But uh, if, it, if they do fail, it means you started pushing your point along this region here in the finite life region. And if you start yielding the part as well, you may have a one-off failure, like instant failure of the coupling. So all these things we can use uh, to, to derive what sort of rated torque, rated speed, rated axial capacity we want for the coupling or we need for a product range or for the application, what sort of safety factors we actually end up with. And if you are operating in this region, how many cycles would it take to fail that membrane or fail that spacer? We can then look into that analysis as well. So just to give you a comparison, what, what really is a standard coupling, what really is a high performance coupling, uh, for a similar diameter, you can see the features. Uh, um, you can see how we reduce, reduce, like change the dry bolt arrangement, how we reduce the thicknesses, uh, reduce the mass. Um, we had to obviously increase the strength of this as well. So we had to use significantly higher strength materials compared to a standard range. Um, higher grade stainless steel membrane, higher grade component materials, thinner sections. Uh, high performance at the moment uh, use anti vintage feature, vintage flanges as well. Uh, we, we sort of argue this point, to be honest. Uh, we did some CFT analysis. Uh, we, we proved sort of really these are not as beneficial as people think to, to the system, but customers still prefer it. If they prefer it, like I said, customer preferences, we have to supply it. Um, and they are happy to pay for the cost of it, so why not? Um, but going forward, we are trying to convince more customers that we really don't need it, especially for lower speed couplings. Uh, we obviously optimize all these selections to find a good product range, standard range, but we can then bespoke optimize a product uh, for, for the customer's actual requirements. And competitors can do just the same. So we obviously have to develop the product, define the capacities. We have to analyze the systems and have better understanding of what sort of stresses do I need to look at and understanding if, if my bending on the bolt is uh, acceptable. Um, when it is bent, uh, is it causing any further cyclic stress or is it just a steady stress? Understand it, compare it in the modified Goodman fatigue analysis and prove that my bolt is sufficient. And bolts are safer than the membrane packs, really. So you want your membranes to fail first, and then if something else fails, it should be the dry bolt. Then what else is failing? Probably the spacer, and then maybe the guard ring, maybe the hub, and you don't want your shaft to fail at all. So there are so many features here that should fail way before your shaft failure, because we want to make sure the coupling provides the safety as well as transmit all the duty requirements. And power density we mentioned here is basically, you want to have the minimum mass for the maximum capacity for the coupling uh, so that you can push the product range. But then again, you have to manage your commercial aspects, how expensive these things can get. And uh, if the customers would be paying for, for, would be willing to pay for it, if there is enough value in it, yes, they would be. But uh, yeah, finding that value is quite critical in product design, definition of product capacity. One other thing I want to mention here is the coupling stiffness. Um, you will have uh, different parts in a coupling, like the fasteners, uh, hubs, flanges, guard rings. These are all different components. You will have the membrane packs. And uh, really, the, the parts, the solid parts, are relatively rigid compared to your flexible membrane. We will also have a spacer. 
And spacer is also a rigid part, it seems like, but actually it can well be very long because it is so long, the stiffness of it may be comparable to the membrane pack stiffness. So it can be relatively flexible in a system as well. Here I'm sort of defining the stiffness as like the rigidity over length for a tubular section. Um, you, can, you can then say stiffness again, just the load by displacement divided by displacement. It is pretty much the same thing. So we have a coupling in series. We have to assemble it together. We have to look at all the different parts. It basically is a spring in series. You have to combine all these torsional stiffnesses together in a spring. And then you do some product testing, look at the stiffnesses and find out the difference between uh, like differential between load and displacement to derive your torsional stiffness um, for, for the coupling. Uh, you will find uh, some couplings may have varying uh, torsional stiffness. You then have to find out how to com how combine these stiffnesses together. And uh, for a steel material, you will have some energy absorption if you take it to a, a load level and bring it back down. Um, but actually, torque fluctuations will be quite low in a coupling, so you will hardly have any energy absorption in a, in a flexible membrane coupling. But if you have a reciprocating application or a really high torque fluctuation, you will have some dumping actually added to the system. Uh, it will have some dumping characteristics associated with it. But um, in the grand scheme of things, you tend to ignore it. It is not going to change the vibration characteristics that much. So what do we mean by torsional stiffness? You basically fix one side of it. You start twisting the other side. You find out what the displacement, but how much rotation, how much angular twist you get at the end of it. And that will give you the torsional stiffness. And we have to understand the natural frequencies as well, because there is a phenomenon called uh, critical uh, frequency or resonance of a part. If you have uh, such a stiffness and such a mass, um, then the ratio between the two will be related to a specific frequency. And if you hit that frequency with your voice like an opera singer, you can break a glass. And same thing happens for any material in the universe. It is not, not just for the glass, it is for everything. And uh, this relationship is true for literally everything you see in life. If you have some stiffness with a mass, it will give you a natural frequency. And the mold shape for it may be different. The load required may be different. The displacement may be different. But you will have a natural frequency associated with it. So we analyze undumped uh, natural frequencies using maybe hand calculations or finite element analysis um, and um, understand the define the characteristics. And when it comes to torsional vibration, you will have various uh, critical bands that we have to avoid. And you can change the torsional stiffness and shift the position of the selection. So coupling's torsional stiffness can be adjusted to avoid critical speeds and prevent system vibrations. Uh, we do our best not to select a coupling that, will, that would cause a vibration. But for any reason, like a system change, system upgrade, whatever has happened that caused system vibration, we can still change some parameters in there to make it work. Some couplings may require a larger size coupling, but it is, at the end of the day, one way or another, we can, we can solve the problem. Natural vibrations for a constant stiffness material, like think about a normal spring, it will have a constant stiffness value. You tend to have a characteristic for frequency uh, to the natural frequency as a linear position, linear line. So imagine I'm operating at 1000 RPM, that would be the frequency, 1000 RPM. Um, natural frequency for this one, let's say 5,000, and I'm only operating at this range. My vibration amplitude is only this much. There will be vibration, you can't stop vibration, but the amplitude will be significantly low. But if you start going towards natural critical frequency and uh, hit that point, then you will have infinite deformation. It means you will destroy everything you have got in the system. There will be some damping effects, like um, the, the amplitude will be softened down if you have sort of medium damping. Uh, if you have light damping, amplitude will be higher, but you, you will still have vibration. You will still have uh, critical frequency associated with it. So the only way around it is not playing with the damping. It is to play with the torsion stiffness or axial stiffness or whatever the stiffness you are concerned about. 
if you do have a nonlinear stiffness, like the axial stiffness is nonlinear, you will have a nonlinear behavior in the natural frequency. So the, the graph will slightly change. So as you increase the speed, the stiffness will increase. As the stiffness increases, your frequency, natural frequency will increase. So you end up getting a bent curve for the for the vibration amplitude amplitude graph. So axial vibration sort of looks like this. So you will have your guard rings fixed, your membranes basically acting like a spring. You have still have a rigid component in between. Uh, this basically starts shuttling back and forth. This is sort of the axial shuttle, axial natural fr frequency. And you can also have a lateral, lateral natural frequency that basically puts the membranes into bending. Your spacer will be bent in the first bending mode shape. That can be a second mode shape, but it will be significantly higher natural frequency, significantly higher operating speed to achieve that, that shape. There is a, like infinite number of um, natural frequencies. You just find the natural frequency for the first mode, multiply it by two, three, four, five to find other frequencies. Simply, like put, put simply, that, that's how it works. You also get sometimes like unexpected vibration modes. Uh, we tend to expect like a whirling, a whirling shape, bending shape in a spacer. But if you really operate at a very, very high speed, you end up getting some collapsing mode shapes. And uh, these cannot be calculated by hand. You have to do simulation to find these out. So if you have a very high speed application, you really would like to do a model analysis to find out if, if the spacer is uh, adequately selected for it. Um, critical frequencies will be seriously high for these mode shapes anyway, uh, so, so product ranges usually are fine. But if you start pushing the market, go for higher speed, higher speed, you really need to start simulating stuff. And the collapse sort of looks like this. Imagine this is happening while the coupling is also speed, like rotating at the same time at maybe 3,000, 5,000 RPM. So the frequency for this one may be different. So it is growing and shrinking in different positions in the rotation axis, let's say. You can also tune your spacer, make it larger in diameter, maybe increase the mass, but uh, add more stiffness to it, change the critical frequency. You can maybe make it a solid shaft, add more mass again, but actually reduce the frequency. So you can play around with the standard, standard option and uh, spend some money to make it work for your application. One thing here I'll give you is uh, damping versus natural frequency. Um, I'm a bit cautious of the time as well. It's almost coming to half past 12. I'm a bit rushing here. Um, the, the thing to note here is uh, this uh, MIT lecturer sort of gives a really good lecture here. Maybe you want to watch it. Uh, he sort of talks about you can actually sort of roughly estimate the damping coefficient based on how many cycles would it take from a known displacement starting point to totally come to the neutral uh, uh, point. So imagine you have a spring system, you put a displacement to it, you release it, it will go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The, you count the number of cycles it actually took to get to 50% of the deformation value. So if you put 10 millimeter to start with, if it reaches five millimeter, in four cycles, your damping coefficient can be calculated by 0.11 divided by four, and, and that would give you 2.75. So seriously, actually low damping for a spring. But imagine couplings have really high natural frequencies. You will have thousands of RPMs maybe, perhaps. Your damping, that means, will be significantly low. Therefore, you can literally ignore the damping on a flexible membrane coupling torsional damping, let's say. You can pretty much ignore it. If you do, do have uh, high torque fluctuations, yeah, maybe you can have damping, but really, then you have a constant smooth drive, you hardly have any damping in the system. In the special applications, we will have some shear pins. You can say add safety features, features. Instead of failing the membranes or the spacer, you can fail a shear pin. Um, you may have a special arrangement with a hydraulic uh, fluid that's pushed inside the hub to expand the hub to work like a clamping arrangement and uh, use that. And as the torque increases, it will snap off the end of the end of this and break the break the contact and it will start it will still keep spinning. Um, so you'll have a safe feature to prevent uh, other component failure. 
uh, you can have a shear spacer, you can have a shear pen, you can have a hydraulic safe set to do a similar job. But what you want to do is, you, once it's failed, you want to make sure both parts can still sp spin in the same concentricity or a close concentricity. So the membranes do not fail, other machinery do not take any torque. Here we have some special applications. You may want to limit how much axial misalignment you have on the coupling. Uh, so you may have really high fluctuating displacements on your machinery, but you want to limit it with the coupling. You can add these spherical joints to constrain that. Um, that will add some limited end flow to your coupling. Uh, these will obviously add a lot more cost to, to the coupling, but uh, it will help you with um, having some maybe an impeller uh, hanging in the air, having too far, uh, too much axial thrust on it, moving it back and forth, and the coupling will stop that happening. It will constrain it. You also have uh, some case studies here um, for vibrations, maybe. A reciprocating engine seen really seriously high cyclic torque that caused some fretting and actually failed the membranes on the link. You will see some fretting marks on the membranes. So high cyclic torques are seriously damaging to couplings. You would want to have some, add some flywheel to a design to prevent any vibration. Um, you will find the membranes will bow, you know, you have under you have a membrane link under compression. So this would be buckling basically and uh, the amount of buckling will increase if you have too high torque. And if you start cycling this, the displacement will keep changing the cyclic stress on the compression link. You may actually fail the buckling link instead of the tensile link if you have seriously high buckling loads. So it really depends on the operating point. But if you also have a vibration, it will loosen the bolts. If you are losing the bolts, then, then it will fail the membrane in a totally different failure mode. So we have to look at all these different signs of fretting. If, if some vibration issue may have occurred, um, if they have caused some problem, maybe you will end up having some bolt hole elongation that will cause other issues again. So we have to consider all these. For this um, application, they had a actually flywheel in place, but that flywheel didn't perform well enough. They still had some vibration and failed the coupling. So they had to look at all the vibration characteristics of it, what sort of starting cycles they have seen. So on this graph, if I explain it a little bit, this is the speed here. You see there is no speed added. There is really low speed, but you have very high cyclic torque to start with at the startup. This is a direct online start, which is, again, a painful operation. Then it, when you increase the speed, it starts smoothing down a little bit, and you can see the accelerations changing again. These are the accelerometers for the vibration. Um, and over time, as you increase the speed again, it starts going into the cyclic torque again. And this is the part that adds even further fatigue damage. You already had a lot of damage here, but you're adding even more damage over there. So we have to avoid this. What they had to do is um, increase the mass of the flywheel, which then kept the same stiffness, therefore reduced the frequency on the system. That then made sure that we avoided the critical band in the vibration system that made everything run smoothly. So we totally solved the vibration problem by literally just changing the mass on the flywheel. Uh, to, to be able to define what mass you really need, you have to go through the whole analysis to, to find out what sort of inertia, mass moment inertia you need for the flywheel to correct the problem. So to tell you about these failures again, really the couplings are operating really long, long hours. I mean, this operation time really educates the about 20 years, 30 years time, literally even more than that. Um, usually you'll find a failure because of the installation misalignment was wrong. When the installation is not done correctly, you have high misalignment, uh, it will fail the coupling. You may then find maybe 10% of the time the torque fluctuations uh, cause the problem. Maybe the coupling is not selected right because the duty is not defined properly. You may have some additional movement in the service, like the foundation movements or other things that added more misalignment. Again, sort of related to misalignment, to be honest. Um, you may have torsional resonance. Again, these are like low chance. These are very really low chance that, that these are happening. Uh, corrosion, axial bolts, failures, things like that really happen very rarely, really rarely. If you sort your insulation, you will prevent most of the failures in a coupling. 
like here you can see how membranes are bowed so much and it broke the membranes in the middle because bending stress in the middle just increased so much. It may even have contacted the guard ring or the hub here. Here you have a torque failure on the spacer. The way I can tell this is you have a 45 degree angle to start with. It sort of uh, reduces sort of towards 67 degrees, 45 degree angle and following through. This is a typical torsional uh, vibration issue or torque failure issue. I also want to say, like, you see a lot of couplings protected by guards, and people assume if the coupling fails, the guard will protect the vicinity. Actually, these guards are designed so that you don't touch the coupling once it's in operation. You don't drop anything on the coupling while it's operating. It is not designed to prevent the failed parts flying out of it. It can easily destroy the whole cover. It can easily destroy your factory walls, never mind the metal structures. It, if, especially if you're operating at very high speed and your spacer flies off, your transmission unit flies off. That's why we have these industry standards to ensure uh, all the spigots and sockets or anti-fly features ensure nothing can fly off from the system. So you can see here how easily this, this part looks like a cheese when, when, you, when you have something really failed and flew off. Um, in controlled environments, you can you can these, do these things, but we have seen some uh, factory failures as well. Um, um, for, for competitors, for our couplings, I can't really remember if, we, if our couplings failed that way, but uh, there are couplings failing, so we have to be really careful. With that, I will conclude and uh, pass it back to Tim for any questions you may have asked. I know I have been going on a bit, uh, just talking to myself probably. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you very much, um, Mora. Yeah, we've got we've got a few questions um, that have come through, and so yeah, we'll try and wrap up um, quite quickly. But we'll uh, I think we've got um, chance for for two or three. So, so the first one is, when would you use a flooded cup coupling against a dry coupling? Is there any coupling? Is there are there any application benefits for flooded? couplings um flooded couplings i think you are referring to the fluid couplings they basically work like the coupling you have in your transmission unit of the car so your gearbox uses a similar fluid coupling uh, what it does is it smooths the torque transmission it uh, provides some damping characteristics as well um but the, the amount of torque it can transmit will be limited compared to a flexible element coupling so main advantage of the fluid coupling would be the damping characteristics of it and how it uh, copes with um, maybe some fluctuations in torque. So it's, it provides a smooth drive for the driven equipment when your driving equipment is quite harsh in operation. Okay. Um, yes, we've got another question. Why aren't flexible membrane couplings used in automotive instances? applications instead of CVs and UJs. The combination of lightweight and low cost would seem ideally suited for this application. Yes, I think the main drive there is uh, cost is not, well, it, it depends really how, how you are pitching it, but a misalignment probably is the main thing when it comes to universal joint. Imagine you have a universal joint with a very high um, angle or misalignment it can take. You can have a single universal joint in place rather than two universal joints to accommodate the parallel misalignment. So it really depends on how much torque you have to transmit, how much misalignment you have to transmit with it, and what sort of speeds you're operating at. To me, it makes more sense to have a universal joint if you have very low operating speeds, um, very low speeds as well, and um, and you have really high torque transmission need and high misalignment need, then universal joints seem to make sense. Although, yes, it does fluctuate the torque, but uh, it, it would be commercially more viable to select a universal joint in that case. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so, sorry, just going back to one of the questions, uh, the first question, um, so just a, a follow-up. Um, so rather than um, flooded, um, it was actually referred to continuous lubrication of the coupling. Okay. Um, like the gear couplings will be filled with some grease to make sure the, the gear's teeth are always lubricated. Spring grid couplings operate in the same fashion but transmit the torque through spring. But it again needs to be flooded with oil to prevent any wear. The, 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 thing they, the reason they need oil is because you have two metal parts rubbing against each other and uh, 
constantly moving and you will have some clearances. You will have high wear on the parts if you don't have lubrication. Flexible membranes are rigidly bolted, you see, that, that, therefore you don't need any lubrication for these couplings. That, that sort of is the main, main difference. And you have to maintain all these grid and spring uh, grid couplings and um, uh, gear couplings and replace your oil frequently to make sure it doesn't have too much resi residue from the worn teeth and things like that and a degraded uh, oil material. Okay. Um, so another one on, on flexible couplings. Do, do flexible couple, couplings suffer the same cyclic variation in output rotating velocity as a universal joint when inlet and outlet shafts are misaligned or is the input rotation exactly maintained? It would be pretty much maintained. The coupling wouldn't result in an additional vibration issue or torque fluctuation because um, it is, like I said, everything is like a rigid spring with just different spring stiffnesses, but it is a rigid spring, literally. So because of that, uh, we don't have any slack in the system. The torque transmission would be very smooth, very smooth with the flexible coupling. Um, yeah, and one one final question. Um, can you please elaborate more on coupling and component balancing? Right. So, okay, balancing can be done in a part or component level. You can literally put the spacer on a balancing rig that will spin the spacer and find out what sort of reaction forces it generates. Um, and then they can just add some holes on it to prevent any, like, make sure the mass is concentric to the rotation axis. Um, you can do it on a spacer on its own. You can do it on a guard ring or a hub on its own. Uh, but when you assemble these things together, again, you will have assembly tolerances. You will again have some misalignments in there and eccentricity of the mass because of the way the tolerances stack up. You did your best to maybe add a spigot socket arrangement, but there still will be tolerances. And you will have some flexible elements in there, like the membrane. Uh, they will have tolerances. Then you have misalignment in there. Um, we have to do our best to make sure everything is perfectly aligned to start with, so that when in the misaligned condition, the reaction forces are still kept low. So your bearings don't suffer as much high loads. I hope that answered the question. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that, that's all the questions. And so um, I think really just um, in terms of closing remarks, I'd just like to thank um, Morat for uh, giving his time to, to produce this talk. It was, it was really interesting. We discovered um, a lot about mechanical design and the application and considerations of flexible membrane power transmission um, couplings and um, definitely um, sparked a lot of thoughts and, and obviously um, some interesting questions as well. Um, please get in touch with uh, Murat if you have got any inquiries and also um, please fill in the online um, feedback form to re receive your um, CBT um, certificates and um, yeah uh, we always encourage people to uh, engage um, online in the process industries community discussions um, via LinkedIn. So yes thank you very much uh, for attending today and, and, and again just finally thanks again to, to Murat. Thank you very much, Tim. No problem. Thank you.